It is my pleasure to introduce Don Aerosmith, president of the Philadelphia Area Computer Society. Don will be helping us learn all about the VPN or the virtual private network. He used his first computer in 1961, a Bendix G15, which had a whole two kilobytes of rotating drum memory. He has a BSEE from Lehigh and is retired from working at a US Naval facility which collected data from aircraft engines via computers. He has taught algebra at two colleges, is a past APCU advisor for Region 3, and is currently the president of the Philadelphia Area Computer Society. He maintains several websites that he hand coded in PHP and MySQL. VPN, what is it? Why should you want one? How can you get one? And how to use one? To get the answers to these questions and more, let's turn to the presentation over to Don. We have a lot to get through, uh, but you can um, use this as a um, summary of what a VPN is. It's a, uh, if you have a VPN uh, in service, uh, as far as the internet goes, you have been transported from where you are physically to some other location. And the reason to do that is to either you have a disadvantage where you are compared to where you're being moved to, or you have an advantage at the new site compared to where you are. In other words, you'll either want to get away from something or you want to get to something. Um, so what are we going to do today? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what a VPN is and why would you want one? We'll see how to get one and use one, and then how you can run your own for free if you have a router, a file server, or a Raspberry Pi. Uh, probably uh, almost the last half will be setting up a VPN on this particular router, which is mine. Now, if you do not have this router, which I would be surprised if everybody did, um, don't go away because if you have another ASUS router with uh, OpenVPN in it, it's probably very similar, if not identical. If you have uh, a router from another supplier who can include OpenVPN, it'll be very similar. And even if you're using a commercial VPN, setting up the client will be um, have a lot of uh, similarities. So um, let's see what a VPN is. Uh, it's a way for you to uh, take all of your internet traffic from your device. And a device might be your computer, your tablet, your phone, smartphone, um, and encrypt it and send it to someplace else. Now, um, you may say, well, I don't really need a VPN because I always just use HTTPS on any website I go to. That may be true, and that's that's great. However, um, uh, that doesn't encrypt all of your traffic from your other apps that are running on your device. Uh, the VPN makes sure everything is encrypted and sent through that tunnel. Uh, when it comes out at the other end, it gets decrypted and then routed onto the final internet destination. So in other words, where you end up connecting thinks you are at your VPN server and not where you are physically at. So that, that server could be um, a room away, or it could be half a world away. Uh, of course, nothing is free. There's always trade-offs. Uh, it's going to be a little bit slower, or maybe even a lot slower. And if you're trying to use a VPN for security, uh, you've transferred the uh, trustworthiness uh, problem from uh, whatever would happen at your uh, current site to your VPN server. So let's see why we might uh, want one. Uh, the most often quoted reason is for security reasons, mainly while you're on a public Wi-Fi. You might be at um, your dentist office, a coffee shop, uh, library, whatever, and uh, you're not the only device that's hooked into that network. That network is either no password or a password that's published all over the place. Uh, you also might want to hide your destination from 
your ISP so that they don't track you and give you targeted ads, uh, just check to see where you're going and so on. Uh, you might have to um, bypass a firewall or maybe block domains on this public Wi-Fi system. Maybe a, if you happen to be at a library, maybe they've blocked some domains that you may have to go to for some particular reason. Um, you might want to just be in a different geographic location because you have a streaming service that has country restrictions on there. If you want to see something from the BBC and you're not in England, uh, some things might be restricted. Um, and um, if you have your own VPN server at your home, it would be a way for you to connect back into your home network uh, even when you're somewhere else. You could access files on a, your local file server, maybe uh, use your printer, send a fax, uh, use an ad blocker if you have one on your LAN or get to other devices that are there. Uh, so let's take a, a better look at the um, security thing while you're on Wi-Fi. So here's a, a general drawing of, of um, you with your device. And again, it could be any device. And you go into a place with some uh, public Wi-Fi and you find that network here and connect into that network. You maybe needed a password or maybe you didn't. If you then start um, uh, sending traffic to some destination, your packets are gonna go out through the air over to this um, access point. It'll go in through other devices at that facility, whatever it is. It'll eventually end up on a router to go out to the internet and it'll be routed out to your final destination. Now, uh, these connections are probably either fiber or copper, and they're uh, very unlikely to be um, uh, snooped upon. But each of these devices, your device plus the access point are like your favorite radio station. You send out your packets out into the air and anybody with a compatible receiver in between uh, uh, within range can um, recognize that uh, signal and uh, see what packet you're sending. So let's say somebody else comes in and it's, uh, we'll call him Mr. Snooper for lack of a better reason. So he's everything that you send plus everything that access point sends back to you, he is going to get on his adapter. Now adapters are usually set up so that um, at the very beginning of a packet is the address that it's being sent to. And so the default is for the adapter to just discard a whole packet if it's not addressed to your device. So that's kind of like the honor system. And uh, Mr. Snooper here uh, can run a uh, packet sniffer program. Now, if you think that's hard to get, I just did a search for uh, some Wi-Fi sniffers this is uh, two different articles that are um, recent. And the first list is 11, the second list 25. There's only two duplicates on here. Wireshark is one and um, there's another one there, Kismet, I guess. And um, I'll mention here that um, Bill said that the slides will be posted. Uh, anytime you see something that looks like a link here, that's gonna be a live link in the PDF slide. So if you wanna go back and check either of these two uh, articles, you can. Um, so uh, this sniffing software is not hard to get a hold of. And all of these programs uh, don't do the same thing, uh, but there are some that uh, can um, look and uh, see what is actually happening. Now, if you're looking at a, an encrypted um, packet from your web browser, uh, that's gonna be very difficult, if not impossible for somebody to decode. But we're gonna see an example where um, some of the other packets to go back that are not encrypted will give the snooper more information and the more information a bad guy has, the easier his job is gonna be. So um, let's look at some other threats while you're on Wi-Fi. Um, he can uh, set up a man in the middle attack by making up a phony Wi-Fi network that then um, intercepts your traffic and then sends it on and 
you won't know the difference unless you go to try to go to a place that he wants you to go to, and then he'll intercept it and so on and so forth. Um, he could set up a, a website that looks like your bank. And um, when you try to log in on his fake website, he'll keep the um, username and password and then be able to go back to the real site and log in as you. Um, he might uh, have something that can go through and substitute data um, from ba back from a location with uh, data that he wants to put in there. And there's uh, many, many ways, but we're gonna look at one in particular. So I'm running Wireshark here. And um, down in the bottom uh, corner, we'll see, I start a command window and I've said ping wellsfargo.com. Um, the first thing any application has to do is convert this domain name, wellsfargo.com, into an IP address. It doesn't matter what it is, your web browser, whatever, or ping in this case. So what the ping program does is tries to convert that. And it does that by sending this out to the uh, DNS server. Now, on this particular system, there's one DNS server. I have uh, IP version six and version four running. So it sends two questions to that server in both IP version six and IP version four. And uh, what it says to that is, do you, can you tell me the IP address for wellsfargo.com, either in IP version four address or an IP version six address? So it sends out four questions. And um, here is the first answer back from my um, DNS server over IP version six, and it's sending it back to the IP version six question. And it says that wellsfargo.com is at actually several IP version four addresses. The first one is 159.45.170.143. And as soon as ping gets that back, it actually does the ping and you can see that it sends it to that IP address. Now, Wells Fargo didn't answer the ping, but that's not um, what we're looking at here. The, what we're looking at is that you on your device asked to um, figure out where, where Wells Fargo is. So if someone is snooping, they'll see that in plain text and know that you are using Wells Fargo. So if somebody wants to set up a phony website um, and he wants to set up a bank, he knows you're on Wells Fargo. He only has to set up Wells Fargo. He doesn't have to set up the top 20 banks. So there's a lot of other reasons why you would want to have your information encrypted. And um, this is just one of them. So let's, uh, let's look at the same situation with a VPN in place. So um, what you've done uh, is set up a uh, VPN service. I, I'll note it down here. And the orange colored lines now have encrypted data. So everything that you send out, you and put uh, on your open VPN or whatever protocol you're using here on your device, in that format, which encrypts it before it leaves. So this is encrypted, comes over, passes right through the access point, right through their router, right through the internet, and ends up at the VPN server. When the server gets it, it decrypts that, makes it look like a normal packet that you started with and sends it out from there, goes to your destination. If he makes a response, it comes back here, goes to the VPN service, that re-encrypts it, sends it over the encrypted tunnel back here. Mr. Snooper can look all he wants. He's not gonna be able to figure out not only what you're saying, but where you're going. So this is what we want to accomplish. We wanna keep everything um, hidden from him. So I've shown this here with a commercial VPN service, but um, as I mentioned, we can set up your own VPN server. It could be on, um, a file server on your router, a Raspberry Pi, or some other um, configuration here. And when we send out these encrypted packets and it gets decrypted here, 
you have the um, option when you're setting it up to allow access to your local area network. And this is how I can get access to my printer, uh, my other um, computers at home here. I could do a remote uh, desktop connection from my laptop and the library back to my home computer as long as it's turned on. And it would seem just as if I were right there in the same room with my local area network. Um, also, I have a whole LAN ad blocker. If you went to my talk on um, on uh, Pi Hole, a Raspberry Pi blocker, um, any request to the internet that I make here goes out through that. And so I get the benefit of that ad blocker. It's also possible to do a double hop uh, VPN. And what that would do is um, set, make a connection to a commercial VPN service out, out here. Um, and there would be a, a VPN client as well here on your uh, local router server or Raspberry Pi. And it would re-encrypt it and on this green connections, then go out to there, that service, commercial service, would decrypt it and send that on. So what a double hop VPN would do for you is, is keep your destinations hidden from your ISP. So if you don't know, want Comcast to know where you're going, um, this is the way to do that. But of course, if, if this path, the orange path is a little slower, the green path is going to be a little bit slower still. And we're going to look at uh, some of these slowdowns in a minute. So just uh, as a summary, then, um, we're going to relocate you by using a VPN. So if you're at a cafe here and you have uh, a device with you, this is referencing uh, the um, Raspberry Pi VPN, but this could be anything. Um, we're going to encrypt it, take it to our local service, and then um, access these things or send it out through our ISP out to the internet. And um, um, that's kind of a summary of what we're gonna be doing. All right, so let's see how to get one. Um, there's numerous services that are available for a fee or for free. Um, if you opt for a free service, it probably has limited performance meaning it might be slowing you down even more than uh, normal VPN, or it might limit your traffic to a certain number of uh, megabits or gigabits per day, per hour, per month. Um, and if you wanted to uh, look for trustworthiness and you are signing up with a free service, um, maybe you wanna check their privacy policy and so on and check references from other users uh, to see if you're going from bad to worse. If you pay for a security suite, maybe, um, I think um, Norton has one and uh, McAfee may have one, would include a basic VPN service, um, which they will try to upgrade you and give you better performance. So you might have something that you could try to see if, if this is something that you like. But we're going to spend some time looking at uh, running your own VPN service for free, especially if you only need this occasionally. Um, you know, I'm home most of the time, and if I have to be at the library or um, a medical office or something, I'll turn it on. But I'm, uh, it's a very um, small amount of time, and so I can live with the slowdowns. So if you want to get a commercial service, Again, these are live links on the uh, slide set. Um, here's an article in, um, I think it might've been PC Magazine, to um, how to pick uh, a service. It reviews several of them. Uh, here's three here, ExpressVPN, TunnelBear, and StrongVPN. Um, TunnelBear, for example, has a free tier. You could try it, see if it works out for you. And then if you want it the regular price, uh, over a uh, yearly um, contract is about $10 per month down to $5 per month. Um, NordVPN is another one. This is a um, table that was in 
that uh, PC Mag article with uh, several VPNs listed here on the left and uh, showing you how much the download speed and upload speed was affected by using the VPN. So in some cases, you know, if we're talking about 70% slower, um, that doesn't mean it's unusable, uh, but if you're paying for 100 megabits service at your home, um, you know, and you're gonna slow that down 60%, you know, you're down at 40 megabits, which may be fine for what you need when, when you're using it. So um, I tried some um, uh, measurements here. And what this is, um, this is my Android smartphone in my apartment uh, connected to my network, um, which is a uh, five gigabit network, and then on my Comcast internet service. So this is uh, a speed check app. And you can see I was getting 114 megabits down. Um, we have a open network available here and that's right outside my apartment. And when I connected to that and ran the same speed test, you can see I'm at 34 megabits roughly. So um, it's slower than uh, my home uh, Wi-Fi. Um, this is that open network that was at 34 megabits connected to um, connected with my VPN running on my um, client here going home and then out. So you can see we're dropping down quite a bit. Here's another uh, a different speed test with the same, comparison, it went from 64 megabits down to about four. So again, it looks pretty dramatic, but for what you're gonna use, and if you don't use it that often, uh, you may not even notice it. So how are we gonna use it once we have it set up? Um, each device has to have some client software to make its half of the connection and do the encryption and uh, make the connection to the VPN server, whether it's at your home or the commercial, um, the commercial service. Uh, usually the service you subscribe to provides the client. And once you have it connected, uh, con configured, you, you just touch a little button on your device. It makes the connection and that's all there is to it. So let's just uh, mention that um, client versus server mode, the client, will run on the device that you're sitting at and the server piece could run uh, many different places. My router that we're gonna look at has not only a server piece in it, but also a client piece. And that would allow me to do the double hop VPN that I mentioned earlier. So when you um, think about using a VPN, the first question you have to answer is, uh, which protocol are you gonna use? This is uh, five of them. Point-to-point -point protocol is insecure. It's uh, quite old, don't use it. The second one, level two tunneling protocol does not have any security with it. So you have to combine that with uh, IP security. Another one, it's a two-step process. It's older, it's not um, really recommended. SSTP is secure socket tunneling protocol. It's Microsoft proprietary. You might find it on your device. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I wouldn't recommend proprietary uh, protocol ties you down. OpenVPN is what we're gonna be talking about mostly the rest of the day here. It's um, open source. It's widely used. It's available a lot of places. Uh, obviously it's free and it's been audited for security many times and it, it's rated very well. There's a newer one called WireGuard that tries to uh, give you better performance than um, some of the other ones. Uh, it's relatively new, so it's not available too many places. And there are some, uh, some uh, problems with its rollout. So at, at the present time, I would recommend sticking with OpenVPN. That's gonna be available in uh, different routers and different services. 
So let's see what how OpenVPN does its magic. And I think this is really um, interesting. So on our um, device, um, this, this is not quite uh, accurate here in a series of VPN box, but this is really gonna be an application in your device probably. Um, what, what happens in there is the apps that are trying to talk to the internet, they do their normal thing. They take the data, they're gonna encapsulate it in the transport internet layer and then the Mac layer to get it in a format that's just ready to go out on the wire to the device. So if you're not using a VPN, that's what, what's gonna get sent out. If you are using a VPN software or if you have a VPN box like this, what it does is it takes that packet. The first thing it does is encrypt it. That's this red cross hatching here. Once it does that, it makes up a new set of internet headers, uh, transport and internet layers and uh, Mac layer to get out onto the internet and the IP address here is going to be where your final destination is. And it'll send that out. When it gets to the other end, the, the reverse is going to happen. It's going to strip off those headers, decrypt it, and then uh, pop it back on through, uh, through the tunnel to the other uh, device. And it'll look, your, your application won't know it went on a VPN. I think it's magic. So a couple of other notes about it. If you have an ISP that um, you may be aware that uh, there's uh, no new IP version four addresses available. And what some ISPs have taken to use is carrier grade NAT or CG NAT to um, expand the number of IP addresses so that they can continue to uh, sign up new customers. That will be a, a significant problem uh, if you're trying to use VPN. And if you find yourself in that situation, you can usually call the ISP, tell them, and they'll switch you over to a, uh, a real IP version four address. Uh, the other thing is if you're using uh, cable broadband, um, downstream and upstream are not uh, the same. It's usually upstream is about a 10th of your downstream. And because if you're using your a VPN server at home, uh, the encrypted uh, packet has to come in from your device over that tunnel and then get sent out again to the final destination. Your overall stream, effective stream, is going to depend on both your down and upstream. So um, it'll be a little bit worse than if you were at home trying to do it. All right, so in at the one of the last slides is uh, a complete article on running um, a VP, open VPN server on a Raspberry Pi. If you're not familiar with a Raspberry Pi, it's a, a little bit bigger than a pack of cigarettes. It's very capable. The new version, version four, uh, really could almost be used as a, as a desktop uh, PC. Uh, they cost... Uh, it depends uh, anywhere from 15 to $50. And um, that would be a very um, cost, uh, good, good cost, uh, low cost uh, method for you to get your own uh, server. Uh, we're going to end up uh, putting it on our uh, router today. Several manufacturers include VPN, open VPN right in their firmware. So I happen to have an Asus router, but I know TP-Link, Linksys, and Netgear include it on um, probably not the basic router, but the higher end routers. And if you find yourself with a router that doesn't include it, you might be able to reflash the firmware in your router with something that supports it, including Tomato, DDWRT, OpenWRT. Again, these are links and you can um, find references to this either with a Google search or looking at the link in the, uh, in the slides later. So again, my router is this particular model and we're talking about um, really uh, something that will probably work on most higher end ASUS routers and other routers will have very similar configurations. Uh, before we can uh, end up um, 
configuring our OpenVPN, we need to be able to find uh, our home LAN. Now, if you're like uh, me, uh, you probably have a dynamic IP address from your ISP. And that means that it's possible that um, every time you turn off your router and plug it in again, you would get a new and different IP address. Um, unless you pay for a static address. Um, so we're going to have to work around that. And the way we work around that is uh, using dynamic DNS. Uh, there's a lot of free services that provide this. I'm going to reference two of them today, Change IP and No IP. And <clears throat> what they do is you have uh, some software that runs inside your LAN. Get a little drink there. Um, it checks your external IP address at uh, regular intervals. Mine does it, I think, every five minutes. When it notices that it's different, it um, sends a note off to, um, um, to that service and tells it to update your IP address. You're given a uh, domain name through that service. And if you reference that domain name with a DNS uh, server, you can then find your external IP address. So if that sounds a little confusing, we're going to do a little bit more detail. My router uh, and many routers include an updating feature in there, and you can pick a one service to do. Now, uh, I use two of these, actually use more these days, but we're going to look at when I had was using just two, uh, I couldn't use the router technique to um, to um, update both of them. But there's another service called DNS-O-Matic, and you can configure multiple services at DNS-O-Matic. I have my router set to update DNS-O-Matic. It goes and and tells everybody that um, I have a new address. So a couple things about uh, static IP. Uh, if you say, okay, well, I'll just uh, pay for one. Uh, you can only get it on a business account. If you have a business account, it's more money. Um, and you have to pay more for the static IP above the uh, business account cost. And when you have a business account, you have to use their gateway and you'd have to put their gateway into bridge mode and then get your own router anyway. So. Uh, DDNS is a better uh, solution. So the first thing we're going to do is set up an account on <clears throat> one of these services. This is what Change IP um, looks like. You um, sign up for the service and then get to your dashboard. Uh, you can see here that um, it's I've, I've blurred out uh, most of my uh, personal information on these slides, but I have uh, my own uh, address there, uh, the, the, my domain name. And if I, when I try to resolve this, it comes back with my current IP address, which we can see down here. Um, so that's uh, change IP. The same thing would happen at no IP and any other service you use. Uh, I also use open DNS, which is a, um, a, a DNS service, and they like to know my my current uh, address because uh, they do filtering on uh, malware, and so they have to know what my address is. And I'm going to move along because it's uh, we're running late here. So um, you can uh, go back and look at the slides, uh, see how they can do filtering. They also do some statistics for you. And we'll move into DNS Somatic. And again, DNS Somatic is, is from uh, OpenDNS. It's free. Set up the account and then just uh, pick however many services and which ones. And um, it'll update it whenever you tell D open, uh, DNS Somatic. So here's my dashboard at DNS Somatic. And you can see change IP, no IP, as well as OpenDNS. They all have my current external address here. They keep a history of. Uh, updates to these, and um, 
once we get that working, um, we can get ready to go into my router. So this is what my router uh, looks like. The main navigation is off on the left here and I'm gonna click the WAN tab. When I click that, I'm gonna see this screen open which has several tabs. I'm gonna click DDNS and we get to this screen. So when I um, turn it on, when I, I first got it, this DDNS client was disabled. I clicked yes to enable it. There's a drop down here, which I've um, opened up and put on the right hand side. You can see there's a limited number. I could have picked no IP. It didn't have change IP, but it does have DNS-O-Matic. So pick DNS-O-Matic, put the credentials in here and say apply. And that's all you need to do. It'll keep uh, open DN, um, it'll keep DNS-O-Matic updated and that will keep the other ones updated. So let's uh, try this. We're gonna find our current address. I'm gonna go to, uh, What's my IP.org? Uh, it says my current address is this. I'm going to open up another command window and um, say ping. And this is my domain name from change IP. And you can see that it evaluates my current external IP address and then does the ping. Um, if I try to resolve my address at no IP, you can see it resolves to the same IP address and that works fine. So we're, uh, the whole DDNS system is working. Um, if you are wondering about version six, IP version six, uh, some of them, uh, Dyn-V6 is one that will um, update a dynamic version six address for you. So now that we have that set up, we can set up OpenVPN. Um, We'll, we'll do that, and then I'll just note here that you can get uh, the client software um, from OpenVPN for the desktops and then through the Play Store and the Apple Store for your smartphones. So we'll go back to my router, and this time I'm gonna click the VPN tab on the left-hand side. We were at WAN, we're gonna go down to VPN. You can see the client uh, software is here. We're going to click on VPN server. We're going to click our protocol. Now, I'm not going to pick PPTP or IPSEC. We're going to pick open VPN. Again, that was defaulted to off. I'm going to turn it on. Once I turn it on, I'll come down here and I'll add a username and password. This is what the client's going to use to make the final connection here. I could have used the router login, but I didn't want that uh, information spread out to my remote devices. Uh, when you get that set up, you wanna come back up here and export the OpenVPN configuration file. When you do that, it's gonna let you download a file onto your, um, onto your device that you're configuring this with. Um, um, what did I get here? Uh, okay. All right. Uh, we have one more thing to do before I leave this. There's a drop down here under VPN details. Uh, if I click that, I get to a choice between uh, general and advanced. Uh, clicking advanced gives you all of these other options, um, which you probably should leave alone. Uh, but there, there is a lot of configurability here. Uh, once you're happy with this, you can go back and uh, export that file, and then we're ready to set up our clients. All right. Um, you, uh, when it exported that file, it's going to use what we put in as the um, DDNS server, which in my case was DNS-O-Matic. That's not uh, what we want to use to resolve. So I'm going to have to go through and edit that configuration file. If you happen to be using no IP, you, you don't have to do this step, but um, we'll have to go through and uh, edit that and we're gonna see how to do that in just a minute. And also, um, if you uh, are running your server not on your router, you're going to have to uh, forward a port on your router to get inside, but that's 
if you know how to set up a server uh, inside your LAN, you already know about forwarding ports. So let's look at that uh, file that we downloaded. Uh, that, that file is a, a text file. It's a long file. I put it in uh, two columns here. I omitted the certificate values and the key values here. That's what uh, does the encryption. Uh, but what you need to um, edit is this part in green here. So this is the domain name that would show up on the router. We need to change that to one of either your domain name at no IP or at change IP or whatever you're using. And I'll mention that uh, ASUS has a uh, dynamic DNS service available for free, which you can just uh, set up and um, that's available too. And of course, then the configuration file would be correct. All right, so I mentioned that you can go to the Play Store if you want to get the client for your um, Android phone. Uh, you would just uh, uh, install this and then run it. And the first thing you would do is add that configuration file in. You can email it to yourself, open it on your phone, and import it right here into your um, into your OpenVPN client. Um, this is from the app, Apple App Store. Again, this is what you want to look for, this OpenVPN Connect. And again, uh, install it, start it, and import that configuration file. If you're using uh, Windows, Linux, or Mac, you would want to go to OpenVPN, and you can load the uh, client file from there. So once you have it set up, this is my Android phone. You can see I have uh, both my change IP and no IP uh, configurations loaded in here. And I do that just because these are free. One may not be working at a particular time. I have not run into that, but uh, all I have to do is just uh, select the other one if the first one isn't working. And so you just would click this from off to on. It would look like this. Um, you're connected. This is this, the other, the disconnected one. But once you connect it, it gives you a little um, running um, stat of how many bytes you're transferring. It's got uh, some other information down here. And we can um, test that. This is my, uh, my Android phone. I have the VPN off. I'm somewhere. It's got this IP address. I just click that button to turn the VPN on. I again go back to what's my IP address. Um, and now you can see that my address is 69, blah, blah, blah. That's my home address. Um, I'm going to just run a few minutes over probably because uh, we started late. If we can't do that, uh, Bill will tell me to stop, I, I'm sure. Is that correct, Bill? Okay. Um, double hop VPN, I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, and I'm not going to spend time on this. This is if you were going to use a double hot VPN, this is the client tab in my router. And this is how you would, um, how you would um, set that up. Again, VPN is only part of a security plan. Uh, there's some tips here for the whole thing. Um, you should be doing that besides just worrying about a VPN. And these are uh, two pages of uh, links that I referenced. Uh, you saw those on other pages. And um, here we are. So I'm not running too far over anyway. So uh, Bill, we okay? Hey, Don, thank you very much for your presentation. This is Jerry. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, I know you skipped over some things because uh, we started a little bit late, but uh, I'm sure that uh, people got something out of that presentation. I got two important questions for you that came from uh, people watching, Don. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah, one of them is, does this VPN stuff bother my streaming uh, on my TV set? Well, if you were home and you were streaming, um, 
I think uh, a lot of them make adjustments to the quality of the picture, depending on how good your connection is. So if you have a nice fast connection, it gives you a nice HD picture. If, um, and I'm talking about mostly Netflix here. If, it, um, if it's uh, not such a good connection, it throttles it down to maybe, um, uh, you know, 720p. And if it's still not very good, it throttles it down further. So uh, it may or may not bother you depending on the actual uh, speed of your connection once you make it. Okay. And the other question that somebody had uh, near the end there was, uh, I assume it works okay with mobile phones. You covered Android. Uh, how about Apple phones? Yeah, I did mention that uh, it's available in the App Store, the same OpenVPN uh, <clears throat> Connect software. And if you sign up for any of the commercial services, uh, they will tell you right up front that it works on any device and they will make that client software available to you if it's not uh, using the uh, standard OpenVPN client. The uh, benefit is if you get that um, configuration file from the commercial service, it's probably already configured and you don't have to go in and do any of the editing as I had to do to change the domain name for the connection to my local uh, LAN. All right, fantastic. Again, Don, thanks a lot for your time and effort putting together this presentation. I'm sorry we got off to a little rocky start, but it seems like we're rolling now. We're gonna leave the chat box open for a couple more minutes, folks. So if you have some more questions, you wanna get them in because we do save all the questions out of the chat box and we'll send them on to Don and send the answers on to you. And right now we're going to start our moderator slides again, and we're going to have fun listening to that music and waiting for the next presentation.